order on. Uh, so welcome again. This is Noah Lenstra speaking to you from Greensboro, North Carolina on the campus of the University of North Carolina. And I'm pleased to welcome you all to uh, the first in a, what I hope will be a quarterly series of webinars on movement-based programs and public libraries. And we have uh, some great presenters here today, uh, Jen Carson and Gwen Geiger-Wolf. Um, we're going to be discussing with us some best practices and examples from their libraries um, in New Brunswick, Canada, and um, in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, and so before we, uh, I turn things over to them, um, I'm just going to start with a really quick introduction about the background of this project. Um, so the first part of this project uh, happened last fall, which consisted of a review of the literature and an article in Public Library Quarterly about how uh, movement-based programming was emerging in public libraries. Um, and these uh, resources that I collected are also available on the website uh, to hopefully inspire people to develop new programs and to try different programs for different audiences um, and age groups. Uh, and that led into the survey, which many of you participated in, um, which was distributed in February and March of this year and completed by about 1,600 public librarians from the U.S. and Canada. Um, and uh, the results from the survey I'm still working on, but there's a couple preliminary results that are coming out shortly. Um, and you can also, uh, if you're interested in looking at the results, uh, you can access the webinar, um, the first webinar, which happened in June, which shared some results from the survey. Um, and then um, the third part of this project was the mapping, um, which is this, and this is just a, a representation of some, not all, but many of the libraries uh, that are offering movement-based programs. So this is becoming a huge national trend, international trend, really. Um, and that brings us to um, this webinar series, which I'm hoping will be a catalyst for more libraries to develop more movement-based programs and also share uh, some of their successes and challenges and to really make this movement um, more robust and, and sustainable. Um, and just as a quick note before I transfer things over to our panelists, um, if you can, I'd encourage you to save the date, November 8th um, of this year at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. The next webinar is going to be about how libraries of things um, or circulating collections of objects can be used to promote movement and physical activity. Um, one of our panelists is going to be Josh Burke, who's pictured here on the lower left-hand screen. Um, in his library in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, the library actually participates in a bike share program so that you can actually check out a bicycle from the public library in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Um, other libraries are checking out things like nature backpacks, which encourage people to be active outdoors, um, seed exchanges, which of course promotes uh, regular physical activity in the form of gardening. Um, and so we'll be, this next webinar is going to be focused particularly on this topic. Um, but today, um, our best practices discussion is going to be uh, more of a general overview of um, some of the different things that you may wish to do in your library by two experts on this topic, um, Gwen Geiger-Wolf, um, who is a, a part-time employee of the Lawrence Public Library um, and specializes in the area of health. Um, and this is just, a, if you want to see some blog posts that Gwen has written for the Lawrence Public Library website. Um, and our second panelist is Jen Carson, who is the director of the L.P. Fisher Public Library in, in Woodstock, New Brunswick, Canada. Um, and both of them have done uh, a, a great deal of movement-based programs, and I'm pleased to uh, invite them now to share with you uh, some of their experiences. And we will first start with Jen, and I'm now going to just make Jen the presenter. And Jen, whenever you're ready, you can unmute your mic um, and take it away. Hi guys. Um, yeah, so thank you, Noah, for um, introducing me and also for everyone gathering here today to learn about movement-based programs and libraries. I think um, probably a lot of us are already doing some movement-based programs or we're already active ourselves and want to 
um, but for those of you on the idea of bringing movement-based um, programming into libraries, I hope that this is kind of an eye-opening experience for you and that it will encourage you to want to um, get on board with our, uh, our gravy train of fun. So, um, yes, I, uh, I'm the library director here in Woodstock. Um, a little bit about, my, about me is probably close to eight or nine years ago, I started teaching yoga programs in libraries. I was in a yoga teacher training and uh, yoga has become, as you know, really popular. And I thought, hey, why can't we teach yoga programs in libraries? And they it started becoming one of our most popular programs. This was when I was at a different library. And um, then I was like, well, why can't we do other programs that are movement-based? And so we started having dance programs. And we started having a, a bunch of different things that I'm going to talk about. And I got really interested in seeing the results of this. And um, I had worked previously in another life as a um, autism support worker. And I also worked with kids in the school system as an interventionist, kids that had a lot of different behavioral problems. And what I noticed that a lot of the children that I was working with had these, um, you know, sort of issues that would prevent them from paying attention in class or from being able to participate. And so they were excluded from the classroom, sent down the hall into what I like to think of as my dungeon room. And, you know, the teachers wanted them out of their class because they were being so disruptive and they wanted them to get their work done. But these kids couldn't sit still to get their work done. They had so many emotional issues or problems at home or things going on that schoolwork was just not a priority. And they fidgeted and they moved around and I thought, why can't I start doing yoga with these guys? Maybe this will make a difference. And so I started designing yoga classes for kids um, that had these, you know, cognitive or behavioral or processing challenges and adapting the poses, and it seemed to be working. And then I kind of got bigger with it, and I started taking them outside, and we were throwing a football around, and we were picking up garbage on the playground, and we were, the more we were moving, the more settled the kids seemed to be in themselves. And so I started doing a lot of research on it, and then do 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 fast forward, you know, 10 years later, and, and now I'm writing a book on the subject for the American Library Association about how physical literacy actually ties into whole person literacy. And um, when you affect one area of, of, of literacy, like something as fundamental as how you move your body in time and space, it really affects everything else. So when you think about, you know, learning how to hold a pencil properly, if you never develop the skills on how to hold a pencil in the most efficient fashion, you're never going to optimize your ability to write properly. Your literacy skills and your school skills um, will suffer because of that. And so something as simple as the fine motor skill of holding onto a pencil can really impact um, long-term things that affect children into adulthood. And as we all know, I know in Canada and in New Brunswick and probably the same in the States, um, some of our uh, literacy skills and scores for adults are abysmal. So it's really important um, that we start early with kids, um, teaching them these sorts of skills and body awareness skills and learning um, how to move their body in time and space. And as well, giving them the opportunity because a lot of children today don't get that. Um, they're shuffled from one program to another. They go to school all day, then they go to after school programs. And as you know, a lot of kids are no longer getting recess at schools or gym classes at school. And, you know, they might have an hour a week, if, if their parents can afford it, of some sort of organized program like basketball or something like that. But um, they're not moving all day like, like we used to when we were. And so libraries being places information first before you start just 
you know, throwing literacy programs, uh, physical literacy programs out there because, you know, there may be legalities and other issues, which I'm going to talk about in a second, um, that affect uh, how you deliver your program. But um, definitely try. Start small. You know, nobody likes huge, overwhelming amounts of change, and uh, people will balk at it. But if you aren't already doing movement-based programs, even starting as small as just introducing it into staff meetings or introducing it into um, existing programs like book clubs or uh, story times, getting the kids up and doing a little yoga poses while you're doing a story time, or in a staff meeting, having everybody get up and do a little yoga stretch break, or in a book club, having everybody take a little walk and talk about the books while they go for a walk. Little tiny stuff like that can soon really get the ball rolling until people want more and more of this. Um, so the next slide here is just, I don't have much time, but a, a quickly movement-based program planning. So setting the stage, what kind of environment are you working in? You know, I work in a large public library. We, we have meeting rooms. We have access to outdoor facilities. Um, you know, I've really got cream of the crop when it comes to being able to um, host events like that. Not everybody has that. Um, you know, some people are in small one-person or two-person libraries. They might not have meeting rooms. So first, work with what you have. Can you do outreach? Can you go out to the community and, um, sorry, my phone's ringing. Can you go out into the community and do, um, you know, programs in, in parks? Can you go to local gyms? Can you go to the schools and do outreach programs there? You don't, you know, have to get away from the mindset of thinking that things only have to happen within the walls of the library. Um, and then there's community partnerships. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to be, you know, a black belt. You don't have to be a trained ballroom dancer. You don't have to be a fitness enthusiast in order to operate and have these kinds of programs. So, for example, I put this up um, just to give you guys an example, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Who knew a small town like Woodstock had a thriving Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu club? We do. So I approached the guys at the club and said, hey, you know, do you have kids' classes? And they said, yeah. And I said, do you have classes just for women? And they said, no, but the women can come to our classes. And I said, great, okay, I, I want to learn more about this. And i would never done um, jiu-jitsu before. And I said, I want you to come and give some demonstrations because I bet there would be all kinds of kids at the library and all kinds of parents and adults that would be interested in this. Our library is right next door to um, a women's shelter and, um, you know, and also next door to the Multicultural Association. And so we have lots of people that access our building that could probably um, really benefit from these types of uh, sports and wanting to learn more about self-defense and uh, feeling welcome in our community and also feeling like they can protect themselves and just a different kind of activity. And so I said, hey, come in. And so they came in for free. They laid down their mats and, and we had, I don't know, probably 30 or 40 people attend the event. And they got to give a demonstration and talk about um, you know, the, what the kind of programs they offered. And then they ended up, I think they had 13 kids join the club from that. So they got a kickback of having, you know, more memberships and more people paying dues at the club. And we got the kickback of having a free fun program that everybody enjoyed at the library. Um, so that's just one way of working with community partners that exist. So, for example, I have a volunteer that comes in and teaches ballroom dance. For free, you know, I usually buy her a little thank you present um, from money given to me by the board um, to say thank you, but she was allowed as ballroom dancing and she'll just come in and teach it for us. So there's ways of finding partners and volunteers in your community. You don't have to deliver all these programs yourself. Um, budgeting is another issue. Of course, um, in libraries, we're all strapped for cash. The best thing is to try and have free programs, obviously. Um, trying to get people to volunteer or for some sort of trade, like in the way that we did with the jiu-jitsu demo. They get to demonstrate, you know, what they were doing in the community and, and get more members. Um, you can also apply for grants. I get a lot of grants through, we have something in, in New Brunswick called GNB, Government of New Brunswick Wellness Fund. And so you can apply for wellness grants um, and you can get up to $500. And that's a nice way to be able to pay instructors and things like that. Um, legalities. I always have a um, legal waiver form that everyone who participates in our program signs to absolve the library and my staff and the town and the government of any sort of um, liability. You would have to check with your local authority, um, your local administration, to make sure that it would apply to your laws. Um, the laws in New Brunswick 
um, may be different, but we have everybody signs that waiver, and if they do not sign it, they don't get to participate. We also sign photo release forms, and we sign video release forms because I do take a lot of pictures and lots of video because I like to share our programs on the web. Um, in like our Facebook posts for our ballroom dance program, sometimes get seven to eight thousand views. We live in a town of five or six thousand people, so the fact that we get our um, you know, our media shared that much tells you that people are really interested in this sort of thing. Um, so getting into the marketing, I, I market through many venues, um, Facebook being one of them. Um, we also put people here still listen to the radio a lot, so we put um, little spots on the radio. We don't pay for them. They're just public service announcements about our program. Um, we put it in the newspaper. We put it on our website. And um, we also create a weekly or monthly calendar. Um, one that goes up on the web and one that goes up in our library's paper copies to hand out, and they go to all the schools as well. And so parents and uh, families get uh, get to see like what's coming up in the next month of activities they can take um, their kids to. So that's just a really quick uh, view of some program planning um, foundations, and you can always ask me questions later. I know I only have so much time. Um, so here's some examples of program models that we, we've done here. Every year we do a Kids Kilometer Fun Run. So these are really fun things for the whole family to participate in. Um, and we set up a one kilometer loop, which is starts in the library parking lot and goes you know, a kilometer around the subdivision and comes back. I involve the local police and have them, um, we do it like 10 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday when it's not busy, and the police block off the street and the, we usually involve the River Valley Runners, who's our local running group, and they're all super keen to get people running, and they donate their time and food, and they buy us um, water bottles to give it to everybody. And then we usually ask the local grocery stores, and they donate bananas and oranges and watermelons so we have healthy snacks afterwards. And then I usually go out in the community and find a daycare or something like that and ask them if they would donate money for us to buy books. And so we buy a book for every single child that participates. And so instead of getting a finisher's medal or a t-shirt when they sign up, they get a book and they get to take it home. And so at the end of their one kilometer run, they get to leave. And one of the best parts is after the run, watching and the kids have you know, gotten their fingers all sticky eating their, um, their fruit, I quickly learned to buy baby wipes uh, at the table. So kids will wipe their fingers off and they get their books and they're so excited. And then the parking lot's quiet and all the kids are just sitting on rocks or or the lawn, and they're just reading their book after their, their run out on the road. And it's a really nice experience. Um, last year, we also had a um, local business donate other prizes. So we ended up giving out water bottles and sunglasses and a whole bunch of other stuff, too, which isn't necessary. You know, the kids don't have to have prizes. People will come out just because it's fun. Um, but it's, you know, it's a nice thing for the kids to have a take home. And uh, we get to involve the town and, and the town services. I also have the ambulance come in just in case, you know, something happens. And I always do a yoga break at the beginning to get everybody stretched and warmed up. And I run with the kids, too, you know, and families are welcome to run. And we have people along the route, volunteers in orange vests to make sure that everybody's safe. And it's a really good event. Then we do something similar every summer where we do a bike clinic. And I get a few people from the community that are really big into bikes. A couple of guys, they come in and they bring their tools and they just love working on bikes and they will just fix people's bikes all day. And they don't do anything major, just little tune-ups. You know, if anything needs a major repair that costs money, then they just recommend what the person needs and write it down, write it down for them and then send them on their way. But, you know, sometimes it's as simple as they just need air in the tires, they need a little grease on the spokes and, or, on, you know, and, and the chains and they just... They just fix everything up, and then we do a little, we have the police come and do a little bike safety course for everybody in the parking lot and show people how to make proper turn signals and things like that. And then we usually have some food out or, or whatever, and it's just a fun day where people in the community can come and get their bike tuned up for free at the beginning of the season, and people look forward to it every year because they're like, oh, yeah, when's that library clinic where I can get my bike fixed or you know, whatever. And so that's a that's a fun way to involve the whole family. And then everybody goes off and goes on the trails and goes for a bike ride afterwards or around the, around the neighborhood. And so it's a really nice way to involve people in the library in a way that, you know, is unusual and makes people think of us as more of a community center and not just a depository of books. Um, so then we have programs that are just for kids. 
Um, we have lots of after school programs involving dance or music. We have Irish dancing. We have dance parties where we put on dance music and play with balloons. We try to get kids moving as much as possible. We have STEM and robotics programming where we design um, obstacle courses for kids using robotics. And they have to try and um, move the robots through the obstacle courses. We do, gosh, there's so many things. Um, we do Nerf battles where we shoot each other with Nerf guns and uh, water in the summertime, water guns. We also even do library mini golf. As you can see, we've set up some different, we had an 18-hole golf course set up in the library and the kids played mini golf. So there's all kinds of ways to get people involved. Um, and uh, yeah, when I get this book finished, hopefully uh, you guys will be able to get a copy in. And I have all kinds of things listed in there. Um, there's also the blog that Noah mentioned. I have, I write a blog for the American Library Association and every month I profile a different program. So if you're in need for ideas, that's a good place to look. Um, teens are sometimes, as you know, harder to get into the library. Sometimes they'll come along with their family for things. Um, but one thing that I found really works is yoga with teens, yoga and meditation. A lot of them are under an extreme amount of stress, um, either through social isolation, bullying, um, pressure from school and sports and their families and society, and getting them in to do some yoga and meditation really seems to work. I have other teens that come along to our run club. So we have a run club that meets three times a week at the library. We go for an easy 5K run. And sometimes um, we have teens, especially that are on the um, track team at school. They come, which is hard on me because they're so fast and I have to try and keep up with them. And they're like 16 and they're in amazing shape. Um, but that's a good way to, you know, figure out what kids are interested in and then offer those kinds of programs. When I was working, running the Hampton High School Library, I created a library guild and uh, that was a medieval club based on the guild system um, where the kids could volunteer at the library's pages and they would work their way up the ranks by doing different chores and things at the library, but it was mostly just for fun. You know, we did a little bit of work, but we built medieval models and we did jousting. I mean, you can't do jousting with real, you know, uh, weapons in the library, but we used pool noodles and just whack each other with those and that was really fun. Um, you know, we did archery in the gym, as you can see in the picture here. We created a medieval feast in the cafeteria and then ate it with our hands. Um, you know, so there's all kinds of ways to figure out what these, and this group of kids um, were really interested in anime and magic cards and dragons and things like that. So I found the things they were interested in, and then I discovered things that I could do that were physical-based that I could appeal to what they were already interested in. So it's really about knowing your audience and then coming up with stuff that will appeal to that audience. Um, and then grown-ups. Don't forget grown-ups. Um, we, we still need to move around. And we get very set in our ways and, you know, we go to the gym three days a week or whatever and, you know, we don't want to try new things. And that's the thing with physical literacy is, you know, think about if you never learned how to swim as a child. If swimming was something you were scared of or the water is something you were scared of because you never learned how to swim, how many awesome activities do you miss out on as an adult because you're afraid of the water or because you don't know how to swim? More than likely, you'll be less likely to go boating or, you know, uh, go swimming, go to the beach, um, go water skiing, play water polo, do any kinds of water-related sports, paddle boarding, you know, um, because you don't know how to swim. And so getting um, adults to learn new skills is really hard because we don't like to fail. We're worried people are judging us. We don't want to be beginners. Um, so offering safe environments where people can try new things is great. So um, I talked a little bit earlier about the running and the walk club that we have here at the library. Um, we had special speakers come in and teach us about chi running and chi walking and how to kind of like a moving meditation you do while you're running. It's really cool. You can look it up online. Um, and then you, this is a picture, the international fiber enthusiasts. We have these ladies that come in once a week and they are all about knitting and weaving and all this stuff. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to go to, they had a conference here in town, and I said, can I come and teach you guys some yoga? Because knitters, you know, their hands get all cramped up and their shoulders are all scrunched up by their ears, and their backs get all sore, and I was like, you guys could probably use some yoga. So these are kind of a sedentary group that, you know, are really focused on their craft, um, you know, and who, who would have thought that they would be interested in doing some sports at the same time. But I found a way to market my yoga stuff at the library into what they were already doing. And so I made a little handout sheet for them about how to do some yoga 
while they're sitting and working on their projects so that they can keep their bodies moving. So it doesn't have to be, you know, all about uh, rah, rah, you know, football and, and lots of sports. It can be just moving, getting people aware of their bodies and where they're holding tension and moving in different ways that are unique. And uh, that makes a big difference. So these are just some fun pictures I threw in of us dancing here at the library. We're always dancing. We have tons of dance programs, and this is just some different ballroom dance programs we had here at the library um, for kids and adults. One of these is from a Christmas party that we had, and um, every year we do a big Christmas party at the library, and we have Deborah, the woman in the um, white sweater with the candy canes on the front, is our dance instructor um, for, a, for a ballroom dance, and she came in and taught everybody how to do a waltz, and that was a really popular event. We had strangers dancing with each other, you know, and it was, it was really fun. Um, so I, I don't have time to talk about everything else I have to talk about, but one thing I did want to mention is making sure that your programs are adaptable for people of different abilities. So I did put up this slide here from Sports for Life that talks about um, all the different ways that people can face um, discrimination when going into um, physical literacy programs. And there's a great webinar that I stuck here at the bottom um, by Sport for Life about how to adapt your programs um, for people that may have exceptionalities. And that's something that we try to focus on here a lot. And that's, you know, that could be a whole other webinar in itself that I could do at another time. Um, but just make sure that you're aware that anybody that has a body um, you know, and can breathe, can basically move. They can do yoga. They can, they can do um, different kinds of movement-based activities. It's, it's our job as service providers to be able to adapt the programs to their abilities and not put the responsibility on them to make them, make them feel like they have to adapt to fit what everybody else is doing. It's important for us to make the environment as welcoming as possible for them. And so I, I can't stress that enough and I can't focus on it anymore. Um, but yeah, just make sure that, and, and I can I can maybe blog about some, I have, but I can blog some more about some different techniques about how you can adapt things to um, all kinds of people that come into the library and their needs. So sometimes you need to be sneaky about getting people moving. So there's lots of good ideas for passive programming. Um, this isn't all of them, of course. These are just a few suggestions I came up with for ways to change your library environment to encourage people to be more active. So I'm right now standing at a stand-up desk. I work at a stand-up desk most of the day. When I do sit, I have a bouncy ball that I sit on, a big exercise ball, and um, that makes me sit up straight and use my core. Um, so having stand-up desks in the library for both your staff and for patrons to use, um, stand-up counters for computers, encourages people to move around and not sit for so long. You can also have bike uh, and treadmill desks. Those are more pricey. You see those more in academic libraries. Um, but they're very good um, to get people moving. Having activity cards lying around the library, um, such as a yoga deck, left out in common areas, you'd be surprised. People will open them up, and the next thing you know, you see a whole family doing tree pose. And, uh, you know, yes, the, the cards will get stolen or ripped, or, but a, a box of cards is, you know, 10 or $15, so it's not a huge investment. Having act, um, active outdoor equipment, if you have enough space for it. Um, we have a slide here at our library that's portable. It's a plastic one I ordered online. Um, you know, it was a hundred and something dollars. And we can take it outside on the lawn for when we do programs outside. We can carry it back in and put it up in the children's department. Um, just that little slide, the toddlers and the preschoolers love that slide. So just a little something like that. If you build a great environment that families um, see their kids enjoying, they will want to keep coming back to it over and over again. So working with your municipality to have, um, you know, more active equipment in your area is really important. And make sure that you have equipment that is accessible for all bodies. There's, they, they design swings and things like that now um, where you can actually lay down or um, can be used differently for people that can't necessarily use them the way they are used traditionally. Having different alternative collect collections. Um, Noah was talking about how he's going to have a webinar about that next time in November. Um, so having pedometers or yoga mats or snowshoes or fit kits or different things like that that people can check out and use either in the library or outside of the library is a great way to get people active without actually doing uh, programming. Having movement stations in libraries. So upstairs we have a dress-up center, we have a puppet theater, we have a hopscotch mat, we have that little slide, you know, all kinds of stuff to keep people moving around in your library. 
than offering health-related programs. So it's not necessarily um, moving during them, but things that that promote uh, healthy bodies. You know, so having programs about healthy sleep or healthy digestion or learning about acupuncture or things, or things like that. So having a big display about you know, um, running and biographies and movies about running and or movies about dance. There's, and, you know, there's a million movies about dancing. <laughs> so you can make a display about that. Um, so those are just some really quick ideas about passive ways that you can get people moving in libraries. Um, make sure your staff are also taken care of. I did for about six months, I did a yoga program at our regional office when I was working down in Fredericton. And once a week, we did a 15-minute yoga break. That's it. These were, um, these were with cataloging librarians and technicians who sat all day at, at desks doing data entry. They were not necessarily the most active and fit people, one of whom, she's like in her 80s, but she got down and participated with us. Um, but they, you know, they were keen because they were sore. You know, they were tired. They were sitting all day. Though they, you know, they were nervous about trying it, I started with them. And then these are the results of, of just that, those few months of, um, of program delivery with them, that 100% of them, when they returned to their desk, felt more focused. Um, most of them felt more connected to their work environment, and they felt more grounded in themselves. A lot of them said they had more energy, and then even more than 40% said they felt more mindful. So that's a pretty, pretty good result from only doing something 15 minutes a week over the course of like six months. Um, you know, so getting your staff up and moving either in um, PD days, professional development days, or during meetings, or just having the work environment structured so that people are able to move more really helps. So I always offer when I do one-on-ones with my staff, do you want to sit in my office or do you want to go for a walk? We can go get a coffee and go for a walk around the block. I mean, not all of you are going to be able to do that because you might work in a one- or two-person library, but for, for me, I have that ability and I'm like, do you want to move or do you want to sit? I always give them the option. And so that just little things like that can really help. Um, even, you know, taking a few moments to, um, to uh, set reminders on everybody's clocks, to have movement breaks or bathroom breaks or things like that. Um, you know, we'll just give everybody a chance to remind themselves to get up. And, and move around. So that's all the time I have right now to talk about this stuff, but I'm going to turn it over to Gwen and Noah, and uh, you guys can ask me questions if you need to at the end. Thanks. Bye. Great. Thanks, Jen. And yeah, we should hopefully have some, some time for a lot of Q&A, so um, uh, make sure to make a note of your question for Jen, and uh, we'll have plenty of time, hopefully, towards the end to, to talk about them. Uh, now I'm going to turn things over to Gwen. Um, who, as I said, works at Lawrence Public Library and um, does a lot of her time is focused on initiatives related to health. Um, and Gwen, whenever you're ready, uh, you now can advance the slide and uh, take it away whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And Jen, it sounds like you're doing amazing work where you are. I really like a lot of the tips that I've already picked up, like the books as prizes. I love the bike clinic idea. Those are really great suggestions. Um, it's exciting to see how many people across the country are already involved in movement-based programming. Uh, the report of 1,600 librarians that participated in your survey alone is pretty incredible. Um, but again, I'm Gwen Geiger-Wolf. I'm a part-time information services and health librarian at Lawrence Public Library. And I currently lead a steering committee that we call the Health Mashers here at the library. And they're really health partners that help assist us in program planning and facilitating collaboration within our, part, our partnerships in the community. I'm also a communications coordinator for the Healthy Food for All work group here in Lawrence, which is a part of our local health co coalition called Live Well Lawrence. Uh, Gwen, and, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, I, I think uh, your uh, mic is pretty quiet. If you could move closer to the mic, um, the, the audio is Okay, does that through. help? Can you hear me now? I, I can hear you fine. Um, I'm not sure if uh, if other people can. If you if you're not having a headset on, you may have some difficulties hearing. But um, the audio, yeah, it sounds like it's coming through better. Is it, okay, it's better now. I just turned the volume up. So if that's better, I'll okay. try and speak it more loudly too. Yeah, it sounds like it's better. Sorry about that. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, no problem. 
So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about what our library is doing currently around the area of health and movement programs, and then finish up with, with a discussion a little bit about collaboration in your community. Okay, so um, I live in Lawrence, Kansas, which is in the Northeast Kansas region. We're located between Kansas City and Topeka. And uh, we have a single branch library of about 95,000 people, or that we serve a community of 95,000 people. I'm a newcomer to Lawrence. I've been here about six years, and I moved here from Eugene, Oregon. And I was really pleased to discover just how welcoming this community is, how unique it is, what a rich history it has, including uh, we have the University of Kansas. It's the birthplace of basketball. I never knew that until I moved here. And um, we're, we've been home to writers William Burroughs and Langston Hughes. Um, our library specifically, in about 2010, our community decided to allocate funds for a renovation and expansion, which completely transformed our library and gave us quite a few more square feet for uh, books and collections. And we opened in 2014 in July. And part of this process was also developing a relationship with our local hospital and United Way to develop some area of health. And what we ended up with was something that we call the health spot. And it's really this partnership that helps to bring more accessible, high quality health information to our community. So, um, through the Health Spot, we've been developing over the last few years uh, different types of health programming. We do anything from uh, drop-in services with uh, local career clinic information, working with health navigators. We offer a seed library. Um, we even had something called a floss bar where people could stop by and try different flavors of floss like uh, tea tree or cinnamon or absinthe, which is really fun. Um, and we really try and focus a lot of our programming around the social determinants of health so that we can cast this broad net and this broad view of what health really is, that it's more than just exercise and nutrition, which are very important parts, but also includes things like having access to food and having a place to live and a job. Um, and so everything that we do related to health spot programming tends to be infused in some way with an element of health. So this year, we decided to create a theme for our programs, and our theme was local health. And so most of our efforts have been on, uh, focused on promoting local health systems, providers, topics, and more. And in this slide, there are a lot of pictures, and I apologize that it's a little cluttered, but I just wanted to give you a little taste for some of the things that we've been doing, including we do have health kits for checkout on a few uh, health topics, including physical fitness, heart health, mental health, that people can take home and kind of get an at a glance and a starting place for learning about some of these health topics. We also uh, work on MOOCs, which are massive open online classes, not unlike webinars. And uh, we kind of transform them a little bit by bringing them into the library and providing added value elements like guest speakers and engaging activities and uh, prizes to really keep people coming back. But one of our, our favorite annual events that we host is the Nutrition Carnival. And we partnered with a lot of different providers, including our hospital, but also our local, local circus school, which you can see the picture in the upper left-hand corner. Um, there's a beautiful picture of a girl on a swing, and she's from that circus school. And every year they donate their time and their talents and their gifts to really make that event something meaningful and something really um, artistic and wonderful. And it usually brings out roughly four or 500 people from our community to come and learn a little bit more about healthy nutrition for families. Um, but specifically talking about movement-based programs, um, we offer a variety of programs. I have several of them listed here. Uh, we provide yoga at your library and family yoga. We have story walks. This year we started something called an action book club where we pair a book with a service project within the community. And our first book was a local uh, author who talks a, a lot about um, the native plant species and animal species of Kansas. And then we paired that with a work service day at the Baker Wetlands. And it was well attended. It was a really great experiment. Um, and a lot of people seemed to enjoy it. 
one of the things coming on as a health librarian in, in my library, I was a little overwhelmed at first, thinking that maybe all of the responsibility of programming really fell to me. And I quickly realized that health programming occurs at every level of the library and in every department. And I realized that I was better at promoting and supporting the efforts of my fellow colleagues who are already engaging in health programming and finding ways that I can partner with them, support what they're doing, and as well as doing my own programming. And that took a little bit of the pressure off, but it also really helped me understand that um, health programming is it's pervasive and movement programming is pervasive, and it should be. And it's a great opportunity for working together to promote health. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is just take you through a few, three different options that we've really worked on this year that were successful movement-based programs um, something that's new and something that we've been repeating and then something, um, well, actually a couple of things that we've repeated. But, um, well, I'll just go ahead and get started. So this year, we, someone tossed out this idea of the game of gnomes. I think it was one of our outreach librarians. She had heard about this being done at another library. And, um, at that library, they had a mobile book unit, and whenever they'd go to the different parks and have their pop-up stand, they would put gnomes out for people to, to come and draw them in. Well, when it hit our team here, um, I like to call them our local think tank because oftentimes we like to be really inspired and creative, and we really believe in this idea of kind of edutainment, that we bring people in with really entertaining and engaging um, activities and, and programs as a way of teaching them and helping them to learn. And so they took this idea and they decided to um, create a citywide scavenger hunt that's based on the Game of Thrones. And so they hid 21 gnomes in 10 parks around the city and created maps, created prizes, this whole, this whole game that encouraged people to get outside and find the gnomes. And they had to match up the gnomes that they found to the name that was on the map. And they were all based on characters from the Game of Thrones. So we had Theon Gnome Joy and Cersei Gnome Mister and, and Gnome Snow that they had to find out in all of these parks. And I'll tell you that the community's reaction to this program is really what made it the most fun. Uh, we had one family that created a movie trailer about their scavenger hunt and they posted it to our Facebook page, and it was amazing. Uh, we had others that created spoofs of the game by making um, Lego gnomes and penguin gnomes and hiding those out in the parks, and it was clear that people were really enjoying it. And, you know, we had maps and prizes, but I think really just the novelty and the fun idea that families could go and do something really engaging and get them outside and get them wandering through the parks was really one of the best benefits of this program. Uh, another program that we brought back this year, we started it last year, is what we call our Fitness Fridays. And um, this year for a full nine weeks, uh, we had booked out a Fitness Friday every week. It actually turned into 11 weeks because we did have two rain days. So we were able to schedule the two additional days at the end of the season. And we partnered with local instructors from gyms, um, our parks and recreation department, and other fitness organizations to come in and offer sampler classes on our library lawn every Friday at 7 a.m. And we had anything from Tai Chi to yoga. We had Capoeira with the local um, University of Kansas Capoeira Club. Um, and a special kind of high intensity pain that one of our local gyms likes to call the library grind, which was, it was very good. <laughs> it definitely made us sweat. Um, but, you know, this is really a great opportunity, kind of like Jen said, in terms of not only promoting your local uh, partners and finding ways to work together, but it's a win-win it's a for everybody involved. They get to get their name out there. They get to show a little bit about what they do and who they are and um, get people engaged in some of those activities that are really going to be um, beneficial to them, but also give them that taste of, Here's something that's a little bit different. Maybe you haven't thought about trying capoeira, or maybe you've 
always thought about boxing and, and you were too afraid to try it or what is high intensity interval training? I don't know if I can do that. Well, if you show up on a Friday morning to a free class, you know, on this lawn, it's a beautiful morning, nice and cool. The sun hasn't quite fully risen and we're all out there together and we're trying it together. It becomes a lot more approachable. It becomes something that is really fun and something that you might find just the right fit for you. So that has been really exciting. We've had this year, our turnouts have been roughly about 15 to 20 people each week, which is pretty good. Last year, we had a local swim team that would join us in the morning, so they would boost our numbers up to about 70 people, <laughs> which was pretty cool, too. And uh, we're already thinking about some ideas for next year. We're right across from one of the city pools, and we thought, well, wouldn't it be fun if we got Parks and Rec to come in and uh, do a water aerobics class? So those are some of the ideas that we were thinking about for next year. Um, and then the, the last thing I wanted to highlight is um, something that we developed called the Gym Pass Collection. And this is in its second year. Uh, it's modeled after like museum and state park passes that are for checkout that other libraries offer. Um, and we partnered with three local gyms to provide month-long memberships for checkout. So the idea was really that free passes that you get from a gym that might be for a day or, or even a week uh, doesn't really give you enough time to see how a gym might fit into your real life. But if you have a pass that lasts for a month that doesn't have any commitment, doesn't cost you anything, that might be a better fit. That might give you an, a really good opportunity to see, well, can I juggle that with work? Can I juggle that with kids' schedules? Can I juggle that with our usual dinner time? Do they have classes that I like? You know, all of those realities that you can't really see in a two-day pass, maybe a 28-day pass would work. Um, one of the challenges to this is really uh, finding gyms that will partner with you and that might be willing to either donate a membership or provide a significant discount. Um, all of our passes have either been donated or paid for with a local grant. Um, that can make a huge difference. And I'll say that our first year that we did this, um, we spent quite a bit more of our grant money funding the memberships than I expected. But the second year I went back and you know, we talked it through, we saw how successful it was, um, the gyms were seeing the benefits on their end, and they were more willing to do donations and, and deep discounts so that it could be even more affordable. And so that's where some of that relationship building really makes all the difference. Um, but overall, you know, we've had this collection now that we're in our second year, and we've had a consistent wait list for each of the gyms and uh, people are really enjoying it. And it's been called the best kept secret, even though we're promoting it, people don't always know that this is available, uh, but it is. It's, it's a really nice opportunity for them to connect, not only with the library, but also with their, the local gyms in town. So uh, the next part that I wanna talk a little bit about is kind of echoing a little bit of what Jen has, has said, that we can really do half of our programming, our health programming, our movement-based programming that we do if we didn't collaborate. And uh, the partnership piece is really so critical, but it can be a challenge to figure out. So I want to finish up by talking a little bit about how we've approached that. And um, to start, I want to give a shout out to one of my colleagues down the road in Topeka, uh, an amazing librarian named Lisa Staley who among other roles is she serves as their health librarian. And over the last few years, she and I, we partnered together uh, to talk about different accessible ways to collaborate with our community for health. And we presented a few times about this idea. And one of the things that we did was we created a resource activity book to help librarians address their unique needs regarding collaboration and how to build collaboration solutions in an engaging and fun way that's meaningful for your community. Um, we like to have fun when we get together. She's a high energy person and we just, we really get along. So we decided we would make an activity book and we call it Make Friends, Get Healthy. And it's a literal activity book. It has crossword puzzles, Mad Libs, the works. And um, 
even though it's cloaked in fun, it's actually a really effective tool for um, learning about resources and teasing out different strategies for finding your community's unique needs and ways to meet those needs. And I went ahead and shared that with Noah today, and I'm happy for him to go ahead and send that out to anyone who's interested. Uh, but one of the primary takeaways from that resource that may help in discovering what your library has to offer other organizations in your community, and you might already have this figured out, but as a, a relatively new librarian, I'm um, new to this field. I've been in libraries now for about four years, but I've only been a librarian now for about two years. Before that, I was in public health. I did research. Um, so I, I have a long way to go in terms of learning how libraries work and how to fit in and you know, how do you balance this um, health promotion and health information line that we walk every day. And um, so it wasn't, it wasn't intuitive for me to automatically know how to collaborate with, with my partners and my community and, and to know how to work together and, and find ways that are beneficial to all parties involved. And so um, that's hopefully what this, this resource will help you do. But after talking to a lot of librarians and kind of gleaning from their experiences and, and hearing what they had to say, I boiled it down to really three takeaways. That's a great place to start. And um, three simple things. I call it place, space, and promotion. And uh, it's interesting because after listening to Jen, I feel like she's figured a lot of this out as well. She talked a lot about the, all of these elements. And, um, but when I think about kind of where do you start when you approach your community members and when you're looking for people to partner with, what do you have to offer them? And thinking in terms of these three simple things kind of helps. So place, your library is, the library is always the most recognizable, easily located, reliable resource in your community. And pretty much everybody knows where the library is. And that's a visibility that can be uh, leveraged, and you can lend that out to other people to be an asset to their work. And so thinking a little bit about how the visibility of your library benefits potential partners, is it can be a really important key. In addition, space. You definitely have areas in and around your library that are usable for a lot of different needs. And um, community organizations, they don't always think about that. They don't always know um, what it is that you have to offer. And oftentimes, they're in need of those spaces, especially nonprofits, smaller organizations. Maybe they don't even have a conference room. Um, so thinking about what sort of spaces does your library have that you could offer and make available. Our library, we're, we're lucky to have uh, quiet spaces. We have some study rooms, meeting rooms, and an auditorium, as well as our lawn, where we've, we've hosted events before, too. So those are all options that you can provide. And even being able to say, I have a meeting room. Can I help you schedule that meeting room for your next conference? Eyes light up. People get really excited. And, and they start to really see the benefit of, of this cross-collaboration you know, things moving in and out of the library and becoming that true community center. And then finally, promotion. So I guarantee every library is engaged in, in promotion of some sort, whether you're putting up flyers or you host a community board, maybe you have social media, um, maybe you put things in the newspaper or on the radio. But your marketing channel is huge, and it's very useful to potential partners. Um, and I guarantee, too, that your reach is likely to be larger than the reach of a lot of local organizations. And so thinking in terms of how you can provide that promotion for those partners as an incentive for working together is it's really important. In fact, one of the added benefits to doing that is that they, in turn, when you need to promote something, they can reciprocate by sharing things out to their network and promoting for you as well. So that is uh, our programming at Lawrence Public Library in a nutshell. And I really appreciate you having me here today, Noah. I really am excited to see that we've had so many people turn out for today's webinar. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Gwen and Jen. Um, and uh, so now we're going to get to the Q and A point. So if you take a minute, I'm sure you have all kinds of questions. Um, and uh, 
I, I can circulate um, the contact information, but go ahead and take a minute to uh, write down your questions. Um, and um, I'm sure you have a lot. So um, with uh, with an online webinar, there's always a little bit of a lag because it takes people a minute to, to get their questions out. Um, but while you are typing in your questions for Gwen and Jen, I'm just going to thank Gwen and Jen again uh, for wonderful presentations. Just so inspiring to see um, what's possible um, in libraries and lots of really great ideas. Um, and one big takeaway for me is the importance of relationships and collaborations. I think both that uh, and Gwen and Jen's presentation that really came across um, is that this is something, uh, a, a type of programming that libraries um, uh, don't and, and probably can't do on their own, uh, but, but by working with other, other groups in town, um, other, other for-profit and non-profit entities, uh, city government, there's a lot that libraries can do. And so it's uh, great to hear. Um, and we have our first question now. I, I believe this is for Gwen. Um, so Shannon asks, are the gym passes single passes or family passes? Uh, the gym passes are single passes. A lot of the gyms in town um, don't have programs for children under the age of 18. And so that's actually one of our terms of use is that you must be 18, and 18 years old and older in order to check out the pass. Yeah, great question. And another question for, for Gwen from Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth asks, can you give, give an example of the contents of one of your health kits that you circulate? Sure. Um, currently, like in our physical activity health kit, we have, um, we have books on maybe walking, uh, different strategies for walking, beginning running. Um, we also offer some DVDs, fitness DVDs. I have a yoga deck, one of Jen's uh, yoga decks in there, as well as uh, this fan that I found that gives you a lot of different body weight exercises that you can do in your home. Um, so we try and, and take the approach of a variety of media that we put into the health kits. And then I, I also have a sleeve of free resources so some of these are um, brochures and handouts that we get from our local hospital about how to exercise and take care of your body, as well as information, health resources, books in our library that people can explore, other online resources, stuff like that. Uh, and Gwen, it looks like there's another question here um, about the gym passes. Um, it, it, do you, are people able to request them in advance? So, so um, do you have some kind of hold system for the passes? We do. We um, because it's been new, and also our library kind of went through an ILS shift over the last year or so. Uh, we created a manual checkout system, but we're getting ready to integrate this into our ILS so that it will be an automatic checkout. Uh, but we still filter this through a main service point. So if someone wants to check one out, they come to what we call our ask desk, which is our, our reference desk, and um, pick it up there. And then we're able to tell them a little bit of information about the terms of use and how to use it, and what's included in the packet, and, um, and they can check that out. But we do have a wait list and um, a hold, basically a holds list for that. Great, thanks, Gwen. And I, I think this question is probably more for Jen. I know, Jen, you said that you've been offering yoga classes at your library for, for many, many years. Um, and Wendy asks, uh, have you ever had any uh, local uh, dance or exercise clubs objecting to the idea of libraries offering um, movement-based programs on a free, regular basis when they're trying to charge people to participate in such classes? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Um, so what I did and, and usually try to do before I start any kind of program like that is this is where having community connections and partnerships are so important. So I actually contacted all of the local yoga studios and teachers and, you know, and I belong to the yoga um, Facebook club, the, for the local, you know, yoga teachers Facebook club. And so tr trying to find ways to connect in your community 
um, was really important. And I put the question out to them, like, hey, guys, what are your schedules like? When is the time when you're not teaching a class? I'd like to offer a free class at the library, but I don't want to conflict with your schedules. I don't want to take business away from you. So if you come at it from a standpoint of you're just offering this service to the community, and um, it's to get more people interested in their activity and to get them to, to be more engaged and not to take away. Because, you know, as humans, we have this kind of survivalist impulse where we feel like we want, you know, as much of the pie as we can have and that there's just not enough pie for everyone to have a piece. And um, when you look at things from that perspective, it can be very fear-based. But if you try and look up at it like there's enough you know, movement-based programming for everyone to attend, um, and that we're just growing the movement, sorry for the pun, um, you know, we're just growing um, the interest in this area, then it's a different, a different kind of uh, atmosphere. So at the end of every program, I always talk about the local clubs that offer these services. So at the end of a yoga class, I'll say, and by the way, if you really enjoyed this, right down the street, we have a business called Journey Ohm that offers um, you know, programs for uh, all different kinds of yoga, and I'll talk about that. And oh, and then down on Main Street, we have another gym. And you know, once once a week, I'll profile a kind of a different business. Or did you know that you can do yoga for seniors up at the Air Motor Center, or things like that? And so that way, I'm not taking away or stealing anyone's thunder. I'm just getting more and more people interested in being active. And so that that only benefits everyone. And I and I do the same approach. That's just yoga as an example, but I would do the same approach with dance or anything like that. Great, thanks, Jen. Um, and the question, I think this is for both Gwen and Jen, um, but um, so whoever has a thought about this, I know um, up in uh, Canada there's some long cold winters, um, but Becky asks about uh, Fitness Fridays um, and uh, anything that you may do during the winter months. Um, and so I'd love to hear from either Gwen or Jen any ideas for winter-specific health and wellness programs that you may have tried. Yeah, I don't mind answering this. Um, Gwen, you might have stuff to add, too. It's definitely cold and snowy here from kind of November until April or May. Um, so we have like eight months of winter. Um, so yeah, people get cooped up and cranky. Um, so we do offer all kinds of fitness programs in the winter. Um, we greatly increase our indoor activities um, to get people from being sedentary in the winter. And we call, you know, our programs will be like winter warming, whatever. Or we have, you know, um, laughter yoga, you know, get people out of the house and moving. Um, and uh, But we do things outdoors as well. So I'm working on a partnership right now to have snowshoes um, as a checkout item, as an alternative collection. And um, that's funded through a grant, a fitness grant here. Um, to buy fitness equipment, and so we're partnering with uh, the Meduxnikeg Preserve, which is a local nature preserve, and so people can come to the library and check out um, these, these snowshoes, and then what they can do is when they get their snowshoes, they get a map of the preserve, and we encourage them to go try out the trails, and so the, the Meduxnikeg Preserve gets more visitors and hopefully, you know, more people interested in, in contributing to um, their nonprofit organization. Um, and keeping it going, and we get to have people come into the library and check out snowshoes. So that's something that we do. Um, we also do a Christmas program every year, holiday. We don't, you know, it, it's non-denominational. Um, but like I said in the presentation, we do, like, learn how to waltz and ballroom dance and singing and music and, and things like that that get people moving in the wintertime indoors. Um, there are sliding parties that happen here um, that are put on by the municipality. I have yet to figure out a way how to weasel um, the library <laughs> into that, the, the monthly sliding parties they have up at the, um, the golf course, but I'm going to find out a way to uh, see if libraries can get, our library can get more involved in that as well, because that's a big draw. They get five or 600 people out to the sliding party once a month, and uh, they have a big bonfire and roast hot dogs and have hot chocolate. We also last year had a hot chocolate contest, tasting contest. Now that might not seem like a very healthy <laughs> program, but we offer dairy-free options and coconut milk and healthy toppings and all sorts of stuff. Um, and, and, you know, and it was standing. There was no sitting, you know, there was no chairs, and, you know, unless you needed one. Um, but, you know, people came in and they could try out all their different toppings and things like that. So there's all kinds of ways to do uh, fun things in the wintertime to get people out to the library that are not necessarily book-related. 
Um, I don't know if, Gwen, you have any ideas of things that you've done or if it's cold enough where you live to warrant that. I want to go to your library, Jen. <laughs> it sounds amazing. But um, <laughs> we do have winter in Kansas. We do. I will say it's sunnier than I could have imagined moving here from the Northwest. Um, and, you know, in terms of movement based activities, it's something I think we're really growing. But our library, we do bring in uh, a, like a temporary skating rink, rink over on our library lawn. And we usually bring that in between November and February. So that brings some movement in. Um, and then last year we started what we call light reading program where we offer light boxes in our auditorium and set up kind of a, a really nice reading space for people to come in and, and use that as a therapeutic um, resource for the winter months. And then this year I've been working on putting together kind of another one of those MOOCs that I mentioned, the classes, um, and it's a winter wellness class. And so my plan is to kind of take a broad spectrum of different health um, modalities that you can use in the winter to keep yourself healthy. And I'm, I'm also working with someone who um, includes things like uh, the light boxes and exercise and fish oil and some of the natural um, methods that you can use, you know, anytime to help keep you healthy. So those are just a few of the things that we're, we're working on for the winter. Um, but usually by the time I'm hitting the end of the year, we're already gearing up for our seed library, which does take a lot of our time and um, momentum to get everything ready, packaged, and going. Uh, so that we can launch in late February. Yeah, Gwen, that's something we do here too. Um, we have a seed library and we do a lot of programming from January, February onwards, because of course we can't break ground here until the frost is out in May. Um, so we have we have lots of people that are like, their, their green thumbs are just itching to get into doing stuff. And so we, um, you know, we'll create ter terrarium, terrariums, however you say that, um, you know, or do some indoor sort of gardening things with um, house plants or seed sorting or, you know, talking about seed saving and having people come in for different gardening related programs um, when they can't actually get outside to do a whole lot. But we'll even talk about winter gardening and, and people can set up cold, um, cold frames and boxes like that. And another thing I thought of um, that you guys might be interested in is our running programs in the winter. We do something every year called the reindeer run. Um, you might have also heard of the Santa shuffle that's done by um, the running room. Um, ours is kind of a rip off. We call it the reindeer run. And um, we get everybody to participate. Kids love it. Um, they wear reindeers. You can just get those reindeer antlers from the dollar store and um, or Santa hats. And then we do um, a 1K for the kids and a 5K for the adults. And everybody just puts a small donation in the bin and then we give it to the Salvation Army. And then afterwards, everyone has hot chocolate and candy canes and, and healthy food too, you know, like bananas and stuff like that. But that's a fun winter activity. And we go out, you know, even in a snowstorm. We did it last year in, in two inches of slush. And, uh, you know, and that's a really great way to get people active in the wintertime too. Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks again to, to Gwen and Jen. This has been a really great discussion. I uh, wish we could uh, spend all day talking, um, but I, I don't want to monopolize people's time. I'm sure people have other other things they need to get back to. But really, really appreciate your time, Gwen and Jen. This has been really wonderful. And I just put a couple of links um, in the chat box if you want to follow Gwen and Jen. Um, and stay stay in, um, informed about what they're doing um, at the Woodstock uh, Public Library and in Lawrence Public Library. Really inspiring. Um, and uh, thanks again for your time. This has been this has been fantastic. Um, and I just want to close by making a quick plug for the next webinar, which is going to be November 8th, uh, 2017, um, which is another Wednesday at 1 p.m. Uh, and we ha we have one confirmed speaker, uh, Josh Burke from the Bethlehem, Pennsylvania Public Library, and we'll have one other um, librarian speak about another way that they're circulating unorthodox materials to encourage um, uh, being active and being outdoors. Um, and uh, look forward to that coming up in a few months. Um, and thanks again for everyone. Um, and uh, wish you all uh, the, the best with your own movement-based programs. And please uh, drop me a line about how things are going at your libraries. Um, all right, thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>